So, Pascal, we've reviewed 37 films so far on Two Geeks and a Marketing Podcast. And, of course, like Mutiny on the Bounty today, we've also talked about many other films <laughs> as well. Most of the time, though, the films that we choose usually have a hero that goes on a hero's journey of sorts. But today's film, the title character, the head character in this film, is a really nasty, despicable, reprehensible individual. Yeah, even just the title of the film, Nightcrawler, it's not particularly appealing or doesn't suggest you know a, a story that uh, where well, we're going to perhaps relate necessarily to the, the many characters so yeah it was a challenge thank you very much for setting that up and uh, let's see what we make of it yeah now we have both watched the film this week in fact i think it was last night and we, we were texting each other to say oh there, there we go there, there it started there it's finished nightcrawler set in los angeles and it tells the story of this guy who's basically a sociopath, um, you know, not a nice guy at all, uh, obviously trying to uh, find something to do with his life, and he witnesses um, a film camera crew effectively taking shots at uh, an accident on the freeway, and this camera crew is taking quite graphical shots of um, injured people and then selling the footage onto the local TV channels. So effectively, he buys a camera and buys a police scanner radio and goes out night crawling in LA, effectively trying to find victims of shootings, robberies, car accidents, whatever it might be, to shoot this footage and then sell it to the um to the the tv stations now th 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 that concept alone almost makes my skin crawl i don't know about night crawler but <laughs> it's skin skin crawling you know the fact that the sort of people would do that you know and there are there are certain examples where he could have helped the people at the scene of the accident um before the um police and the ambulances arrive but in fact in what he does is he just chooses to shoot the film because that will get him um, a bigger fee from the tv that is just reprehensible in itself but the actual character you know the way he goes through he becomes absolutely obsessed with this job and and making it better and getting more money and you, you almost don't want to like the film because of that basic premise but it does actually suck you in and before you know it you know the two hours have passed uh, what did you think about him i didn't like the character at all um i was looking for a conclusion we'll come to that but you know the third act but yeah. for me it was just compelling to watch because it was beautifully filmed mostly yeah. at night i don't think there's a lot yeah. of um, scenes taking place during the daytime you've got to obviously praise uh, the writer director for a superb job of creating a, a world and that i didn't know so well in you know, this idea of independent news channels cable channels and the likes buying footage from pretty much freelancers and for the character played by Jay Gyllenhaal to be this almost golem, bringing the worst of business marketing, uh, you know, this generation of people who believe in themselves. He, he spent the most of the movie reciting uh, passages from management books, which frankly makes him, him even more robotic and more of a sociopath than, than ever before. And it's just kind of um, take us on this journey. And, and the feelings that I had watching Nightcrawler reminded me of the feelings I had watching American Psycho with Kristen Bell or the series Sons of Anarchy where you kind of go, I really, really don't like you, but somehow I'm going to keep watching to see where this goes. Yeah, I'd forgotten about that that bit of where he's effectively re reciting passages out of management speak. Um, booked but that uh, you know it's absolutely obvious to somebody like me who you know has rebelled against management <laughs> speak that that's what was actually happening and there are there's the one particular scene where he gives his um his employee almost like an appraisal doesn't he a, a, a discussion oh yeah the, and the words they use uh, yeah. oh and you, you, you just want to cringe he said he says something like and we're looking forward to your creative input in the future and you think oh people don't talk like that you know they they you definitely have read that in a book but i actually have a story about nightcrawler pascal um my sister 
my elder sister lives in Los Angeles. Uh, to be precise, she lives in Venice Beach, where quite a lot of this film was actually filmed. That's right. Now, I was over in um, Los Angeles in 2013, uh, which was the year before this was this film came out. And one day, we were walking along the promenade at Venice Beach. Now, I mean, if you've ever been to Venice Beach, I mean, it's a fantastic fantastic sandy beach but it's also uh, a massive tattoo parlors and and gymnasium some of which one's called muscle beach is actually out in the open air and you can see people working out pumping weights etc etc there's a there's an incredibly weird vibe to it and one day we were walking along the front there and we saw this big red car uh, the dodge challenger surrounded by all the filmmaking accoutrements so we had the lights you know those silvery discs that they always used to use to bounce the light around loads of people running around and this that and the other and we sort of stood around for five ten minutes to see if anything was happening there were no actors there it was just this big red car uh, and there was there was all sorts of prep going on i remember hearing the guy said that they're not actually getting the actors in at any point in the near future so guys don't bother hanging around you know come back in a couple of hours so we went off and we never thought anything of it and then a year or so later when my wife and i first watched nightcrawler we had no idea. And then there was that scene with the red car that was being shot that day. And, and we almost saw, both looked at each other at the same time. <laughs> hey, do you remember that? That was when we were in, that day we were walking along the front at Venice. That was the car. Uh, what is interesting is, so I was in Los Angeles, I think a year just before you. So we miss each other by a year when I went to the American film market. I, I need to check my diary again. And I never had the time to go into Los Angeles, per se, not the city center itself. I spent most of my time in Santa Monica, where the uh -huh. uh, film market was taking place. And it was just 10 days packed with um, meetings, screenings, and so on. So really, I didn't have managed to do the, much of the touristy bit, apart from going to the Sony Studios and Warner Brothers Studios. And I remember, you know, at the time, people were, there was murmurs about films like that, but not, nothing was mentioned in terms of the, um, of the title and so on. So I, I was quite surprised because actually the first time I saw um, And Watch, which also stars Jay Gyllenhaal, I thought that mm. was it. But mm. I, actually not, mm. it was at Night Crawler that people were talking about at, at the time, yeah. Fascinating, yeah. isn't it? Yeah, so so it's not often you get a film where the where the actual the hero in inverted commas of the film is is such a despicable individual, <laughs> uh, and and and, the, and if, effectively by the end of the film, you know he, he you know doesn't get his comeuppance or anything. You know the implication is that by the end of the film, he's actually doing pretty much pretty all right for himself. And that's what's fascinating, and that's where of course the movie is true to this kind of um, indie roots where they don't mm. have to follow the rules or the mm. filmmaking you know filmmaking handbook where you have to have the three acts and the hero journey and so on so it's mm. kind of doing what what it wants but it tells the story really well and i really want our viewers and listeners to understand this is a great movie to watch particularly if you appreciate uh, filmmaking but it's kind of looking at this idea of you know what would happen if a sociopath literally learned the skills from others but then had no boundaries and went all the way to where others would not want to go. So, uh, you know, people say it's, it's that kind of ultimate convergence between uh, business, marketing, and entrepreneurship, but the evil side of it. So we have, for example, Bill Paxton, one of my yeah. kind of all-time favorites. I just wish it was a movie longer. Well, Bill is becomes a competitor to Lou Bloom, played by, by Jay Gyllenhaal. And as is often the case in business, Bill Paxton's character approaches Lou Bloom to offer him a job, to take him out of the equation. Lou Bloom uh, turns down the, the position, but instead of essentially dealing with the competition in a semi-professional way, he's going to go as far as sabotaging the van all Bill, owned by Bill Paxton, causing an accident that he's going to film and so on. He's going to manipulate people. He's going to blackmail people. He's going to do everything that you shouldn't do in business to get you where he wants because of this kind of one commitment to, I believe in myself, I'm all about, you know, I'm for that generation of self-entitlement and I will get what I want no matter the, the means to, to do so. Yeah, and 
one of the things that again really struck me about watching this film again last night was the the hints that it gives you about the society that we live in mm. now. I mean, we all carry around a mobile phone studio now. Our mobile phone is a studio, camera, audio, etc. And you do hear stories of things like car accidents and shootings where instead of helping, people are stood there shooting the footage on their phones. Maybe not to sell to TV channels, but I'm sure some people do. But even just to share with their friends, which is a bit nightcrawlery as well um and and even you know the haps tv app which we've talked about very affectionately here on the podcast many times is built around this idea of encouraging people to be film journalists and getting out there and filming stuff that's going on and like and while she'd like to think that people would be you know filming things that can be celebrated beautiful streets beautiful buildings beautiful events whatever it might be you always know that there will be a dark side to it which is what's highlighted here in the nightcrawler film what is interesting about this movie is you know when you tell a story roger you know that um, all too well you have to give the audience a sense of space and time yeah and what i find fascinating about this movie is you can't quite tell when, as in in terms of a year, it's taking place, it's kind of ambiguous. You know, is it 2014 the year was made? Is it a bit earlier? Mm. Is it a bit later? Mm. I think it's very, very interesting. So therefore, a movie that's not going to age rapidly, I reckon yeah. people will be celebrating its 10th, 20th, 30th anniversary very well. Because let's be very clear, as much as we are uh, essentially saying the, the main character is not likable, this is a very likable a bit of filmmaking and indeed the critics have been very very pleased with it yeah no i agree with all of that so pascal marketing wise mm. was the marketing as cringe inducing as the actual <laughs> uh, central character well happily not so the first thing that um, part of you know what we want to do with this segment roger is to look at the marketing and, and derive lessons for all of us content creators and so typical of indie filmmakers you know i love this story where the filmmakers went to the Cannes festival in 2014 with an unfinished movie and literally as you know distribution companies were fighting with themselves to get the rights to that so lesson number one learn from the nightcrawler film producers <laughs> you don't have to have a perfect finished product to start to talk about it and get people excited about it that's that's really fun that's really fun and there was some quite interesting uh, video stuff going on as well wasn't there didn't Just at the list didn't lou didn't lou put together a video resume that they actually put out on YouTube and LinkedIn. Yes, nearly watched by one million people. The character, Jake Gyllenhaal, in character, put a video out looking for a job, but he, he was really in character. I would argue his video resume and essentially call for a job is better than the official trailer. <laughs> yeah, and again, it, it has that. So that blend of management speak mumbo jumbo and gobbledygook, <laughs> you know, business strategy and, and entrepreneurship and all of that sort of stuff woven into it. And, you know, as reprehensible as the character is, he does, you know, Gillen Cole does a great job in acting that, that part. They didn't stop there, though, Roger. We discovered through research that Lou Bloom the CEO of, um, is it called News Video Productions? That it's Something called? like that, yeah. yeah news yeah. Production, uh, Video Production News, VPN. Remember, it was a strange acronym. Also has, and still has to this day, a LinkedIn profile. Yes. I mean, that's genius as well, isn't it? Absolute genius. So it also, at the time, had a Twitter account, but that's gone and so on. But the LinkedIn profile is still there. I checked it. I must confess, <laughs> I did not send a connection request. And I was thinking, only because actually I don't like you very much. Uh, and, and even though you're a fictional character, I just don't want to be connected with you. But if you look at the profile, there's not much going on, but the same kind of marketing speak in terms of his description. But uh, he has LinkedIn skills, Roger. As follows, entrepreneurship, business development, business strategy, <laughs> short composition, and video editing. It would be interesting to see what would happen if you did send him a connection request and he actually replied. All right, I'll, I'll, I'll give it a go then. But isn't that fascinating that after watching the film, I didn't want to connect with him because you know, my mind was saying, no, 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 it's not the kind of guy you want to have around. 
<laughs> yeah, th- th- there's always that sort of you know you, you'll you'll see telephone numbers on the side of um, buildings in films, and sometimes I mean maybe again it's the geek in me. Like, oh, I wonder what would happen if I phoned that number. And sometimes the filmmakers are actually clever enough to have some sort of recorded message at, to you know to talk to if you do phone that number. And and this again, it's just something like that, isn't it? It's just so in character with that you know you would know that this person would put together a linkedin profile that probably exaggerates <laughs> his skills and exaggerates um, what he can do but it's so in character that it's actual genius that they did this absolutely so t- to me it's funny because yes they've gone ahead of course they have the poster of course they have the teaser trailer the trailer and everything else but it's those little kind of uh, indie m- filmmakers move like the youtube video like the linkedin profile twitter at the time that i think make all the difference of course they, this movie was chosen by many, many festivals indeed. And I think very smartly, it was released internationally on Halloween, which I think was also a smart movie. It doesn't qualify as a horror film by any stretch, but I think it belongs in a in a genre for sure. I guess the title, Nightcrawler, some people may have been expecting some sort of monster <laughs> crawling around the streets of uh, Los Angeles, but actually that's exactly what it is. He is a monster, and he might be driving a very um, uh, interesting big red car around the streets of Los Angeles, but he is. He is a monster. So, yeah, um, a great film, uh, and I really enjoyed it, even though I disliked the character thoroughly. Yeah, if I may, actually, I'm going to quote the um, the CEO of Up and Road, one of the distributors okay. and financiers of the movie to kind of wrap up the film marketing bit. And then I've got a question for you. So it was quoted to say that even though the you know they enjoyed you know the success of the movie, they, they were pleased because this qualifies as a low budget films for kind of uh, Hollywood standards. This was in the realms of eight million dollars, which I know they're a lot of money, but actually most movies are twenty five million onwards really to qualify so the um the ceo of open road basically said you know we are hoping for the best but we're not counting on anything from anyone and this lesson about you've got to create your own luck so you've gone ahead and produced a film you've gone ahead and recorded the podcast wrote the article wrote the book You've got to hope for the best, but you count. You do not count on anyone f- to help. You've got to create your own luck and go out there. And that's what I think yeah. with the YouTube videos, the LinkedIn profile, the Twitter account, the festivals, the interviews, and so on. That's what they did. Absolutely, no, I love that. I absolutely love that. And it. Uh, the, sorry, Roger. So there's a moment in a film where he goes ahead. Where he's stolen a bike, isn't he? And with the yeah. money, he buys his first camera, which is quite pitiful. So I must confess that I burst into laughter because I remember when I bought my first camera, I was so pleased, but it wasn't very good either. What was your very first video camera, Roger, out of interest? Wow, that's an incredibly good question. Um, I think I think it was a Philips um I don't know whether you could even call it a camcorder. It was probably about that big. And my father my father was actually really quite into tech. We we got a, um, a VHS videotape recorder very early on, uh, and he he was absolutely obsessed with video. So he bought this Philips thing, and, the, you know, the cassettes were not quite as big as VHS, but they were really significant. So I... I I can remember well early in my career when I'd, I'd only been working for a, a couple of years. So this is maybe, I don't know, something like 1986. No, about 1988. And I remember that the training manager at the business that I was working at wanted to film some sales guys uh, practicing their sort of conversations with potential customers. And th- there was talk of actually hiring a camera and bringing it in and and doing the filming. And I sort of put my hand up and said, well, my dad's got a camera. I'm sure he'll let me bring it in, which he did. And of course I was the hero of of the um, sales team for weeks after that, because I saved them a fortune. And of course, 
I'd, you know, we just pointed it and, and let them get on with it. But that, yeah, so it was a Philips something. <laughs> yeah, my f- first one I had was a Panasonic, I think. Uh, you still had to use a Super 8 cassette, which is also interesting in, in the movie. They seem to be using cassettes, don't they? To, yeah. And, and still kind of big, chunky, portable hard drive, which is why I, I was interested about the timing and when this movie is taking place. So thanks again, Roger, for choosing Nightcrawler. Again, something that had been on my... Amazon Prime watch list for a long time and we just needed to kind of look at it and enjoy looking at the marketing as well fantastic well thank you everybody we've come to the end of another episode of two geeks and a marketing podcast it's been an absolute pleasure i knew that today's episode was going to be full of really interesting stuff talking about mutiny on the bounty made me happy and talking about Nightcrawler despite that reprehensible character (laughs) is a great movie so thank you for watching thank you for listening if you've got any comments or suggestions just leave the comments or suggestions below the video or wherever you receive your podcasts and until the next episode please make sure that you go out there and make sure that your marketing is done right I was Roger Edwards and he was Pascal Fintoni (laughs) 